Sao Paulo was the first city I started documenting and that was almost by accident. I think it was a stage in my life where I was, where I started wandering again, trying to find my foothold, not only in photography, but in my life. I started documenting Sao Paulo because I accidentally ran into this building that was being occupied in downtown, the Prestes Maya. It was being occupied by squatters from a socialist movement that was focused on giving people a dignified home, which is in the constitution in Brazil. And that just led me to start focusing further and further into other situations throughout the city. People occupying lands in the 1970s, people migrating from the northeast part of Brazil because they needed jobs and they had nowhere to go, so they ended up on the periphery of the cities. Then that also led me to understand how the downtown area of Sao Paulo had been lost to vandalism, to crime. It was still a business center during the day, but at night the city transformed itself into crack house areas, homeless people, you know, a very dark city, no illumination, and lower middle classes living in tight areas. And then that's when I started trying to understand how the city had grown and how the industrial era had pushed it beyond anybody's beliefs in Sao Paulo until it became a, an economic powerhouse. I was missing something about the city and I, and I wanted to focus on understanding the wealthy. I wanted to focus on those who had the power to build their own dream home. And that was based on what I saw in the poor. And it was a comparison of saying like, okay, here's a person who comes into the city out of nowhere and he's got to occupy a land, find a place to live and start building his home. He'll build one room and that's his house for either him or for his family. So the dream house is always built one room at a time. But it becomes a dream because what he really wants is to get out of that slum. And the rich started doing the same thing. They had the capacity to move out of the city and build their dream home in a secluded, gated community. And they started doing that in Alphaville some 30 years ago. What they did was then just have huge lots of land where they could build these huge mansions, but they're empty because it's the same amount of space for five people maybe. It eventually becomes just a couple. So the dream house is also an ideal and it's more of a statement, you know, I can do this. And it wasn't surprising that 25 years later, this Alphaville now turned into 14, 15 gated communities. And they're all kind of isolated in themselves. You know, they got their own security system. They've got their own green areas. They have to do everything by car. They don't really intervisit between communities. They hardly ever even intervisit between neighbors. So that didn't make much sense either until they finally built their own city there. And now it's the wealthiest municipality in the country. And it's surrounded by slums because they need that workforce that comes in. They're living behind walls in fear. And I don't blame them. Brazil's always been a violent country. Sao Paulo has a history of recently being a violent city. Kidnapping, murder. You know, the disparity of wealth causes people to take desperate measures. So, even if you're poor or you're rich, you're taking desperate measures to find a home. When I look at the city from above, I think, God, what have we done? Because I just think of that thing as covered in concrete. And then when you think of Brazil, you always think of green, naturally, right? You always think of the Amazon, the cliche. But when you look at Sao Paulo and you see that they've destroyed so much forest in that southern part of the country too, it's kind of sad to see that we couldn't have built a city in a more organized manner and really taken advantage of all this lushness and built the city within the forest instead of without the forest. That's really sad. When I went out on the helicopter rides to photograph the city, from up there, then I could see how distant everything was from each other, and yet how united it was to one concrete mass. One thing that Sao Paulo has that's really, really scary, especially considering its size and considering the fact that there's so many people that are homeless and without infrastructure, is that there are over 40,000 abandoned buildings in the city. So this is just a very large neglect of what we built, you know. People don't want to live in the periphery. People don't want to take three hours to get to work. You know, they don't want to live out in the slums. It's not because the slums are horrible places. It's just like, why should I be living out in the slum if there is space and there is 
infrastructure within the city that I can take advantage of. Schools, proper hospitals, proper drinking water, you know. And that's where that Brazilian segregation comes into effect, where people like to separate each other, not by color, but by class, you know. Because if you make the money, it doesn't matter where you come from, they'll respect you. You know, you'll still be marginalized because people will always have prejudices, no matter who we are. But if you got the cash, you can get the house, you can be in the place. There's a lot of people squatting because that's what they're fighting for. They're fighting for the right to be a part of the city. And they're being manipulated, they're being used by socialist movements fighting the same thing, you know. But they're still out there, like they, they want to have a home. Every, everybody has a dream of having that, that home where you can come home to and just lie down, you know. Ironically, after three years of doing this project, what I really wanted to show came out in the end when I started photographing the homeless people in the winter. Because it's at that moment that the people need to take shelter. They can't just live out in the open anymore. But they do it and they have to find these corners. And sometimes they do it in clusters with families. But most of the times the people that I found was the individual. And what I wanted to show how we look at homeless people, how we disregard them, how we walk by them. We see them and we try to do our best to ignore them. Because we don't want to be called to attention that someone is needy, right? That's my guilt. So I wanted to show that we had forgotten who they were and that they were just one more part of the urban realm. Because they were so frequent and the numbers were always increasing. I always wanted to show that being homeless and sleeping or being part of that environment just made you one more piece of the furniture that was out there. And the last picture that I took, that was it because the guy was wrapped, he was sitting in a weird pose, he had graffiti on him, he was outside the jockey club, so it was a high contrast of poverty and wealth. And he just, it just didn't look like a, like a homeless person anymore, it just looked like a thing. Like something that you could pick up and take home with you or someone had dropped off, like another package.